welcome to the Southeast Regional Group's AGM and meeting. Um, it has been an eventful year, I think everybody will agree. Um, so let's get going and see what we've got planned for um, 2021. So the AGM uh, plan is, I'm just going to go quite quickly through it. We've got the chair's report. So we talk about last year's events, uh, this year's events. Uh, we've got the treasurer report, although it doesn't look like the treasurer is online yet. Um, then we've got election of the committee. And then, of course, the main event, uh, which is being given by our very own Matt Cook. OK, so um, 2020 was a quiet year for us as Surge. We started off quite strong. We had three presentations um, on a variety of projects, um, but then obviously COVID hit and it got quite um, panicky, I think, trying to organise um, presenters, so hence it being quite a quiet year. Um, we did manage to have um, one online talk on radioactive waste management, which is still available on YouTube. So if you have, didn't see it, please do give it a go. It was a very interesting talk. Um, but the rest of the year, we've tried to keep ourselves busy and have really focused on um, social media. So we set up the Facebook and LinkedIn pages, um, came up with a whole new rebranding. Um, and then as part of that, ran a photo Co uh, competition with the prize being a martini set and we've got some really great entries for that which will still be um kind of posted along as we get light on the social media front um and then at christmas we had an online christmas quiz so 2020 is already looking great for us we've got today's presentation um and then next um Next month, we've got a talk on the Dogger Bank, um, which is called Between the Ice and the Sea, Past Landscapes for Offshore Wind, which is being given by Andy Emery. And then after that, we have a, a rail presentation on the challenges of stabilising the Cumbria coastline, which will be given by uh, Chris Milne from Murphy. And we've got a few other um, talks in the pipeline um, for the rest of the year. Uh, including one on the Harwich Formation, which we'll be doing jointly with um, the um, engineering group as well. And hopefully, fingers crossed, everyone cross everything for some field trips this year, because we missed out last year, so we need to make up for it this year. Um, so this is the one of the posters for the, the next talk, which I hope you all can join us for. Please do spread the word should be a very interesting one and it's based on a uh, recent paper that um, Andy et al have um, uh, released last year. So, um, so financial yeah. summary, uh, oh, somebody's summary. not muted. Um, Johnny are you online? I am indeed. Oh, hi Johnny. Can you just give us a brief um, financial summary, please? Yeah, sure. Um, as probably expected, there's not there's not much to um, to catch up on from 2020. Um, and unfortunately, you can see there on the income side of things, it was um, a big fat zero because the, the grants from Geological Society were suspended. Um, but we've had some good indications that they're going to be reinstated for this year. So um, we can um, plan ahead with meetings and and hopefully field trips, etc. Um, just to summarise the expenditure, we had a few nominal meeting costs. Um, they were kind of at the start of the year when the, the restrictions weren't in place. We managed to get one in-person meeting um, at Holy Baptist Church. Um, and then also, as Holly just mentioned there, we had some prizes that we gave away as well. So. Um, yeah, a lot more money going out than in, but we we had quite a good um, buffer um, in there, so um, nothing to be too concerned about. And going ahead for next year, we're going to aim for um, that grant there of 1,300. Um, so looking all good. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to to answer them. Maybe maybe at the end, um, or you can email me directly. Okay, thanks. So um, 
just to run through the committee, we've got myself as chair, Sarah Cook as secretary, and Johnny, who just spoke as treasurer. We also have um, a rather large um, committee, actually. We've got John Race, uh, John Ellis, Ursula Lawrence, Sam Fellows, Mark Davis, uh, Stuart Fielder, Matt Cook, Sam Davies, and Sam Marshall. So um, does anybody have any objections for that committee to start off with? I'm seeing some shaking heads, so that is good. Um, and do we have any questions as part of this AGM? Uh, Holly, just on the talk side, mm -hmm. I've talked to uh, Dave Holwell, so he's, a de he's in theory a definite. Fab, thank for, you for that. For April. We'll add um, him into the um, uh, programme. Yeah. I'm not sure I've retired yet, by the way. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I might be a grumpy old man, but I don't think I've retired yet. I just copied. I don't know where I copied that from. Um, I'm retiring, of course. You understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. Cool. OK. okay um, I think if, if nobody else has any other questions, um, or anything else I got wrong, sorry Mark, <laughs> um, then we'll get on with the the talk. Um, if you can share your screen, Matt, I don't know how I can unshare. Make sure I add computer sound, that's always a mistake I make. Mm -hmm. We can hear you. There we are. Perfect, you can hear me now. Yep, and see that um, as well. Can everybody see the screen? Perfect. I'm just going to pop everybody's lovely faces onto the my other screen so I can see if anybody's got the hand up. So hello everyone. Um, as Holly said, I'm Matt Cook. I work for Matt McDonald uh, and I'm one of the committee members. So I was asked to give this presentation um, and it's entitled Nagonia Falls Hydroelectric Power Project, a junior engineer in Georgia's experience. So let's get started. So content of the talk. I'll give you a bit of a background, both to Zambia as a country and to the project. Then I'll t tell you a little bit about the regional geology. Um, then we'll look at prior ground investigations that were done at the site. Then we'll look at how we designed uh, the, the ground investigation in summer 2018, the one that I was uh, supervising on. Uh, we'll look at some of the challenges that we encountered during that GI uh, and the solutions that we came up with. Uh, we'll look at the GI findings, so that includes how we got the local geology, uh, a bit about the geomorphology of the area, some area specific findings, and um, whilst the majority of this talk is going to be on the actual GI conducted in country, there'll also be a little bit um, of, of the findings that we got afterwards when we produced the, the reports. Uh, and then we'll finish with some nice pictures and a few conclusions about, um, about the work. So here we are, so background, a bit of a background to myself. Um, so I was a bit of a late starter at, as a geologist. I, I originally was an accountant uh, for about four years um, and I went to university as a mature student uh, and where I studied geological sciences at the University of Leeds. With that, I did an international year in New Zealand um, in the third year. And then in between the first and second year, I worked for a company called Condite Gold Co. So this was when the gold was a big boom when it was $1,900 an ounce. Uh, and I, I was out there doing some regional exploration work. And if you can see this picture here, for the last three to four weeks, I worked on an excavator loading up a gold, um, a gold machine. Uh, so if any of you have watched programs like Yukon Gold, um, that's the site I worked on. Granted, not when they were filming, uh, but yes, it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, particularly in, in the, because I was there in the start of the summer, I got um, 24 hours of light. And by the end, I was getting the Northern Lights as well. So it was a very good experience. Um, I did my postgraduate again at, at Leeds, uh, where I did an engineering geology masters. Uh, and following that, I briefly worked for Dalradian Gold in Northern Ireland. So this is me collecting soil samples in a very, very cold, wet and windy um, fortune in, in Tyrone. Um, and then I joined Mark McDonald in September 2017. Um, so after I'd completed my and I've been working there since. Uh, mostly I've 
been working on HS2, uh, but I've done some international projects, this one here, and some work in Guyana at the beginning of the year before lockdown. So I will I go into more. I want to say some thank yous to the people that um, either helped me put this presentation together or have been uh -huh. involved and, and really has fought it through the, through the project itself. So uh, from Western Power, the, the client, uh, Andy Fleming, the uh, Western Power, who, uh, who who did this, were very, very supportive and, and they have been throughout. Um, so Andy Fleming uh, is the main geotech guy. At Power. I want to say thank you to Checker and Innis, the, uh, um, the drivers that, that took us all around Zambia and uh, supported us and gave us all the local information. Charles, our local guide, um, you'll see a bit more of Charles later on, a uh, really, really nice bloke. Um, Claire, who was a community support, so she liaised between us and the, the residents that were living uh, in Sioma. And Ernest, who was our boatman, who looked after getting us out to the islands. Uh, thank you to the, some of the people at McDonald's. So Paul Connolly, he was the principal supervising engineer who was out working out there with me. Brian Darling, who's the project manager and he's here on the talk today. Uh, Mason Jarvis, uh, Graham Cuthbert, John Madison and Anthony Drake, who were all support in the UK um, that helped put together the, the programme and, and support me through it. And Blue Rock, who were the contractors on site. So Dion Brigno, who was the main geotech lead that I work closely with, and Alfonso Mangala Kakumbi and all the rest of the drill crew. And then an, a little thanks to the guys at Whispering Sands where I was staying. Okay, so Zambia. So Zambia, located here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's entirely landlocked, uh, surrounded by uh, surrounded by eight countries. So Angola, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, and the DRC. Uh, its capital is Lusaka, and it has a population of about 17 and a half million as of 2018. So the main language is spoken, um, common language being English, but there are a lot of Bantu languages, so Bemba, Nyanya, Tonga, Lozi, so I can say uh, which is a good body, welcome. Um, the local currency is the Zambian Kwacha, although very rarely use the, the Kwacha, you generally use the dollar. Uh, there's 10 provinces, and the one we're interested in on our project is Western Province here uh, on, on this side. Um, the climate's quite variable, so it varies between tropical savanna to warm, semi-arid uh, and humid, uh, subtropical. Uh, it's predominantly a Christian country, um, lots of different denominations, um, and the primary exports, copper, gold, tobacco, oleum and sugar. So that's some of the, one of the key features of Zambia and where it gets its name is the Zambezi River. So this, so the Zambia Re Bezi River is, is 2,754 kilometres long and it flows from Zambia um, up in the north here through, uh, through seven different countries and out to the uh, Indian Ocean. So its source is up in this marshy dambo in the north and it picks up and all the tributaries of, of, this, of the northern part of, of um, Western Province and northeastern pro uh, Northwestern Province into feed into the river and the flow increases as we go down. So probably the most famous feature that, that Zambia is known for is the Victoria Falls. So these are located on, on the border between Zambia and Zimbabwe and they are the they are the biggest falls in the world. So they're not the highest, they're not the um, the largest single drop but they are, by sheer area they are the largest in the world. So the 1708 meters wide and have an average height of 108 meters and they flow over a level sheet of basalt um, and with a series of gorges running back from it. Uh, you can see here this is from the, the Zambian side uh, and this is from the Zimbabwean side. So you cross over a, a bridge here um, and you can get a temporary passport stamp to go across to Zimbabwe. Uh, um, so you could, uh, so I was able to say I'd been to Zimbabwe even if I'd only been to the other side of a bridge. Um, so yep, yeah, uh, cool. It, it Lozi, it's called Mozi Autonia, and that means the smoke that thunders. And the reason 
it, the name is so apt is because you can you can hear it and you can see it from a long long way away. <laughs> I guess I've got a little video to give you an yeah, idea. So that was at the start of, of the time we were there. By the by, the end it was it was much um, much weaker. One of the other key geographical features is uh, is Mongu and the Barotsa Plain to the north. So uh, Barotsa land is the historic name, um, uh, the historic homeland of the Lozi people, and it covers um, bits of Zambia and Namibia um, and Angola. And the uh, the uh, Barotsa floodplain that you can see here is this very, very wide um, area, quite flat lying, and it periodically floods through the year. It's really beautiful to go to and historically the only way to get across it was by boat so you can see here um the traditional the traditional boat that the, the king of barotsaland used to go between his winter residences and his summer residences uh in recent times there's been a bridge built all the way across it so now you can access it by road um, but it's a it's a really uh, quite a fascinating place to see key feature the Hari desert so we Whilst we're not in the Kalahari itself, we are on the edge of the basin. So you can see the basin indicated in, in yellow here. So basically this results in every, there being sand everywhere. So anywhere you encounter sand is a problem, whether that's driving, whether that's um, getting excavating. Um, but luckily, um, because we sort of are on the edge of the of the basin, much of that sand is stabilised by the by the local a flo uh, uh, fauna, sorry, flora. So we rosewoods, teak, that kind of thing are, are very, very common. Um, and it's, it's one of the issues that they ha have in the, in the area is that sometimes a bit of deforestation occurs. Um, and where that happens, it, it's almost impossible to then uh, restabilize the sand. And you end up with a lot of dust and a lot of, um, a lot of degradation of the area. So, um, being, keeping the, the local vegetation is, is, is important. So, so let's get into the project itself. So here we are, we're looking at the Western province. So you see down here, here's Livingston, um, close to where the, the falls are. Um, here's a Zambezi River running across. And the area we're looking at is between the, the towns of Sananga and Sasheki. So we zoom in a little bit more. So the area specifically we're looking at are the Dagonia Falls. So these are up, up from uh, up from the Victoria Falls, uh, and located in, near the town of Sioma. So we've got a nice aerial image for you to have a look at. So we've got a, up to the north. There's Mongu down to the south. So Sheki and Katima. Um, Whispered Sands is the is where we were based during the project, and the Nagonia Falls themselves lie here below these series of islands uh, and the river runs runs down here. The new bridge that crosses over is, is located here and the before that was built um, you had to cross over by pontoon bridge so they, they had to load twice a day and go across there but that's now been discontinued we'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And here we are zoomed in a little bit more. So the Nagonia Falls themselves, um, they horseshoe in shape. Um, they have quite, a, they have a relatively short drop of about 10 to 25 meters, but they're pretty impressive uh, and really quite quite stunning to to go visit. Project background. So power generation in Zambia is predominantly from renewables. Hydropower is up to about 85 percent of the installed capacity. There's also solar power schemes, geothermal and wind. So the Gurney Falls project itself is built by Western Power. It's a 500 million pound project, a run of river scheme with a capacity of up to 180 megawatt generation. It adds, it should add about 8% to Zambia's total energy output. This 830 gigawatts per year um, that could be used for local demand and for export.
to put that into context, it would provide power for 200,000 plus homes, and that's the whole population of the Western province. And there's a great focus on environmental and social responsibility. Uh, the Western province is a, one of the poorer regions of Zambia, and so it's really important that um, job, jobs, local jobs, and consultation of the of the local residents is, is um, part of the scheme all the way through. Uh, so it's a partnership between the government of Zambia, the community of Western Province, uh, and private sector. Yeah. Move on to the regional geology. So here you are. So we've got a nice geological map of Zambia. So where we where the site is located is indicated with this star. So all of these brightly coloured squiggles up at the top are the Proterozoic rocks. So there's a, a range of, of metamorphics, um, metasements, um, intrusions, uh, and these are these are all the, the very old rocks. Uh, uh, this area up here is known as a copper belt in, in the north. These are all uh, and this is, as we said earlier, that's the primary export of Zambia. Um, but the bits we're most interested in are these two ones here, the ones indicated in a in a kind of cream, uh, creamy green colour and in this blue. And they're of the Phanerozoic Age. So blue ones are the basement that we find across the area. Um, so this is a Karoo supergroup uh, of the Lower Jurassic and Upper Carboniferous. And this bit that we're looking at here, which is the the Cretaceous and Upper Jurassic sandstones and mudstones. So the three main geological units that we're interested in are the Karoo basalts and dolerites, so that's the Upper Carboniferous to Jurassic Age, the Kalahari, Kalahari group sediments and they're Cretaceous, and the undifferentiated alluvium, colluvium and laterite, so these are tertiary and recent deposits. So we'll start with the Karoo supergroup. So the upper part of the Karoo deposit is known as the Batoka Basalt Formation. In places it can be over 390 metres thick and it rests on older upper Karoo formations and may represent an unconformity between the clastics below and the igneous material above. The basalt is tholitic and ranges in colour from reddish purple to dark greyish green. The lava so shows some variation in composition with early flows being richer in olivine and opaques than the subsequent ones. Primary copper has been recognised in some of the flows, and there are up to 23 flows recognised with a marked textural variation between them. Most are amygdaloidal with infillings of agate, chalcedony, quartz, calcite and zeolites. Uh, some are more blocky and contain fragments that resemble volcanic ejecta. The age and character of the basalt suggests that it was erupted from fissures with little explosive activity and may be related to the breakup of the Gondwanan supercontinent and the associated drift. So, then we move on to the Kalahari group. So the post Cretaceous rocks of Western Zambria comprise the continental sequence of the Kalahari group, which is subdivided into the sandstones and quartzites of the Barotsa formation and the unconsolidated sands of the overlying Zambezi formation. The sedimentation process, which began in the late tertiary times, continues into the Quaternion recent. However, the age of the continental sediments of the Kalahari group can, for the most part, only be determined by inference rather than fossil content. The valley sides of major rivers are flanked by the Barotsa Formation rocks, and as it is not always easy to determine their exact stratigraphic position due to there being very few fossils, they are generally mapped as undifferentiated. Quartzites of this deposit, however, invariably overlay the sandstone layers. The genesis of the Barotsa formation beds is considered to be related to fluctuations in water table and climate. In most cases, the sand was aeolian in origin, most clearly seen by the presence of ferruginous sandstones and quartzites. In some places, however, there's a mixture of aeolian and fluvial deposition. It's been suggested that the high alkalinity in the inland arid region resulted in the leaching out of silica, which was subsequently precipitated as cement on reaching areas of flowing water. This process has been thought to have been continuing since at least the Cretaceous. The Zambezi formation, the upper formation, rests on the Barotsa, includes recent deposits, which we'll speak about on the next slide. The sands are multigenetic in origin, i.e. both aeolian and alluvial, and result from late tertiary erosion of the underlying sediments. 
So we move the third of these are the undifferentiated alluvium, colluvium, and laterite. So, so these are tertiary to recent in age and uh, deposited in various ways. So one of the key features of these are the deposition of hard pans or what we're going to call jury crusts. So they're silcrete, ferricrete, and calcrete. So the jury crusts include ferricrete, calcrete, and silcrete. Calcrete is generally associated with basaltic and limestone dolomite terrains, ferricrete with regions formed by sandstone and basic rocks, and silcrete over acidic rocks. Jury crusts develop because of the seasonal, seasonal nature of the rainfall and the intense capillary action which occurs during the long dry period. The results results in surface enrichment of insoluble salts that cement the surface and near surface residual plastic material. The type of jerry crust depends on the cementing medium and is nearly always formed in situ. And here we are, there's a structural geology. So we're located it here between the Kasai Congo Craton and the Katval Craton, this area here. So the Dagonia Fall site lies within the Paleo Kalahari Basin and is located north of the 550 million year old Muashembe zone, which extends east, north, east, west, south, west across Zambia and is associated with near Proterozoic ductile shearing with a sinistral strike slip movement. Downfaulting in the mid Zambezi basin occurred in the early Jurassic, which reactivated fractures and structural weaknesses from the near Proterozoic and late Triassic basins. Karoo sedimentation in the Botswana Zambezi basin was ended by a period of volcanic activity, which formation of the Karoo basalts. These are known to be up to a thousand meters thick in places along the belt, which runs from Botswana through southern Angola um, and into Namibia and Zambia. Continental rifting, which separated the African and South American plate, occurred in the late Jurassic with the formation of the Tristan plume around 133 million years ago. Following a period of spreading, breakup occurred around 129 to 121 million years ago and created a series of rifts across Africa, with the closest to the site being the Okavango Delta Rift to the south. The, uh, the Karoo post Karoo Age Kafu Basin Rift to the east and a tertiary rift to the south between uh, close to the site between Sioma and Sosheki. So one of the things that we did um, early on in the in the game was to look at the regional liniments. So here's we've got the site located here, and we looked at the aerial photography to see if we could pick up any of these structures. So a regional, uh, so a major set of liniments can be seen running northwest southeast, and this is picked out by the course of the Zambezi River from the Kwando River to the west. Perpendicular to these are the main tributaries of the Zambezi River running northeast southwest. And they're of a similar orientation to the mapped concealed faults to the south of the site. These major liniments are typically parallel and perpendicular to the major rift systems uh, that we showed on the previous slide. Other minor tributaries and liniments across the region are oriented east, northeast, west, southwest, and north, e north, northeast, south, southwest. One of the most prominent features that you can see are these um, almost west east lines. And these are actually uh, myelinite, sorry, these are actually uh, a result of myelinitization and refoliation of the igneous rocks. So these are, you can see the myelinites from, uh, from space. Seismic setting. So, luckily, the location is relatively, uh, relatively low in terms of seismicity. The largest recorded earthquake in the area was a magnitude five, uh, and this occurred about 120 kilometers falls. Um, the figure shows uh, all the reported ones over the last hundred years. To be noted that I haven't cleared these of dependent events and I haven't used and not all of them used uniform mag magnitude types. So, uh, but it gives a good idea of the regional seismicity. So the main faulting mechanisms in Zambia, as I said, were the Mashembe, Wenshembe, uh, shear fault, um, the 
Mazara bans the Shia fault and the Sanango Shia zone. Any current activity on them is uncertain due to the absence of any displacement evidence. Uh, the closest mechanism to Zambi to the Nagoya Falls is the one Shembi Shia zone, but it's too distant, about a thousand kilometers away, to be considered as a threat. So now we're going to the prior ground investigations that were done. So before we came to site, the first phase was completed by a company called Norplan in 2014. So they did a range of GI and did a seismic refraction survey. They did a, some laboratory testing and they produced a factual report. So one of the main um, criticisms to come out of this one was that the permeability data um, was, was suspect. So, for example, they'd used drilling muds when um, were drilling boreholes, which had uh, masked the actual permeability of the rocks. So that had seeped into the cracks and affected the readings that you were getting. Uh, and some of them were undertaken above the groundwater table, giving spurious results. The second phase, this was um, also undertaken by Mark McDonald. This was, sorry, this was undertaken by Mark McDonald, occurred in uh, 2017 and 2018 over, over the winter period. So this included a GPR survey, um, but this uh, this period was, was terminated uh, relatively quickly. There was various issues with the contractor, so they had difficulty getting um, equipment to site. Um, they, they were not, uh, they were not very successful at getting um, good levels of recovery. And in the end, the, this contract was terminated and Mark McDonald uh, returned, uh, look, we, along with the client, we looked for a new contractor to work uh, on the site. And we used that time to, to further develop the, the ground investigation. So now we move on to the work that I've done. So this is how we designed the summer 2018 ground investigation. So here you go, here's a little bit of a, a layout of the project. So you can see up here, here are the Nagonya Falls that we showed earlier, and here's the river running down from, from the north to the south. So the key features that you want to be looking at, so um, along, along this wide, widest part of the river will be a low weir and embankment. We have a canal, uh, then there's an intake and a barrage at the, at the edge here will be diverted into a canal. So the, the canal runs across here, out into quite a large four bay area, through the powerhouse and back into the river here. So we can break up the project into four main areas. Here we are, here are the four. So at the top, we've got the falls, the barrage and the weir. In the middle here, we've got the canal. And in the south, we've got the four bay and the powerhouse. So we'll look at each of those in turn. So let's start with the falls, barrage and weir. So the design here proposes a three and a half kilometer long headworks um, that consists of a low three meter, 900 meter long movable flat gate type flood release weir across the right falls here. Uh, sections of low concrete weirs between, mo between movable ones in between each of these channels and a low overtopping embankment built on top of the uh, the islands. Um, they have an intake structure here um, that connects the river and the canal. So the headworks have been set back from the falls for, m for multiple reasons. To avoid any poorer foundation conditions that might occur close to the falls, to minimise the height of the weir that's required, uh, to limit visibility so that um, it doesn't affect the aesthetics of the falls themselves, uh, to avoid a community nature park that you, you have located down here, and to allow easier access for maintenance and possibly tourism. So this is the sort of thing that you'll, you'll be seeing. So you'll have a, a head pond behind um, that feeds into this intake structure here. And here's, here's a bit of a close up of that intake structure. So you'll have a minor barrage located across here that will produce some energy, um, but the main uh, energy production occurs down at the powerhouse to the south. So the key GI, ob GI objectives that we had for this area, so we needed to know the depth to the Silk Creek. So uh, as you saw, there was that low 
um, and Barton went running all the way along and that we were anticipating that we would be founding those embankments directly onto the Silk Creek. So it's important that we knew where exactly that was located. We also needed to know how thick that Silk Creek was. So um, if it was quite thin, it potentially wouldn't have the bearing capacity to, to take that embankment. And if it was if it was thick, it may, it may mean that if we needed to um, go down any further, we, we might struggle with that. We also want to know the weathering profile of the sandstone beneath. So if we if we build the embankment on the top, it is there's going to be a lot of water loss underneath and through that sandstone. Uh, and tying into that is what is going to be the permeability of the sandstone. Our second part is the canal. So the canal is a 2.9 kilometer long structure with a base width of 40 meters, a two to one side slopes, and a water depth of approximately nine meters. So this is a really big. Um, and it transitions from the intake at the north to the fore bay in the south. It's envisaged that it be concrete lined and it be constructed using cut and fill. So the material excavated from the canal would be used to form the embankments at the side. Uh, the top two thirds of it follow a transient river that's already present um, and it'll take advantage of that. And it's par parallel to uh, the historic Litungus Canal and I'll talk about it a little bit later. So here we are, a bit of a close look. So you can see embankments at either side with a with a cut where the canal is in the centre. So the key GI objectives of, of the canal is the thickness and the depth of the silk route again. So as we want to be going down to a fixed depth, we want to know um, where that silk route is and how we're going to be able to excavate it because it uh, potentially that that material can be used for other things. It can be used for stuff like rip wrap. It can be used for um, for, for protection for other things. Um, but also it, there's an issue with how, how is that going to be excavated? Uh, we want to know whether that material can be reused that we're excavating. And we also want to know what the potential for leakage is. So a bit of information about permeability again. Next area, the fall bay. So this is an area of naturally low lying land uh, behind the proposed powerhouse. The boundary to the west and northwest will be formed by low rock filled embankments. The boundary to the east is formed by this uh, higher elevation ground and the southern boundary is formed by the powerhouse and its adjacent concrete filled rock, uh, filled rock, rock dams. Uh, so the geoactives in this area we want to know what what are the permeabilities of the superficial so where where's it how much of this water is going to be lost out of the fall bay and we want to know a little bit about the ground profile and finally the powerhouse area so this is a a large central concrete structure with adjacent cfrd embankments so this is where the primary power generation will be occurring so there's a it's a really, really large structure. Well, it's envisaged to be a large structure. So, with a base size of 60 to 60 by 70 meters, and an excavation depth of up to 30 meters. So, this will allow it to be founded on competent rock. Uh, there's a transient island that you can see in the bay south of the powerhouse, and this will be used as a site of a, a temporary copper dam during any construction work. There we are. So you can see the four bay behind behind the, the powerhouse there. So the key GI objectives here is we want to know what the depth of that basalt is at the base. So we want to know what the founding level will be. We want to know a rough idea of the weathering profile. Um, so when we build the side, st side structures, we know um, we know what material we're dealing with. We want an idea of the permeability and the groundwater regime. So what are the pressures going to be against the side walls of that structure? So from that, we designed a, spe a specification. So the main things we had were some exploratory holes. Um, these are 21 rotary core ball holes up to 45 meters in depth and four hand pits. So there are already a, about 30 trial pits done at the previous stage uh, that we that we looked at and we used as part of this one, but there were four additional new hand pits. We were doing in situ testing, so that included SPT. Uh, variable and constant head permeability tests and packer testing. And we designed a monitoring installations. 
So we put in place river gauges, vibrating wire piezometers, standpipes that some had data logs, some didn't, and a local barometer to uh, calibrate against. And some of the other tasks that we, we uh, intended to do on site was look at the geomorphology, uh, look at make any observations we could in the area, and identify any sources of material for reuse. So one of the key um, differences that we employed at this on this um, pro, uh, stage of the GI compared with the previous ones, the implementation of paired boreholes. So as I said be before, one of the key issues that we had was if you wanted to get a good recovery, you needed to use drilling muds because you had some quite um, some quite hard materials and uh, stuff that's resistant to abrasion, such as the silkcrete and the the basalt at the base. Um, so in order to to get really good recovery on that, um, you need to allow the uses of drilling muds. So whenever we went to a location, quite often we'd start with a recovery hole. So we'd allow them to use drilling muds, and we focused on getting very high recovery. And we, the only testing that we do in here would be SBT testing. So those first holes allowed us to get an idea of the geological strata, and that allowed us on the second hole, which was the permeability hole, um, to determine where we were going to do each permeability test to make sure we were co uh, covering each each material as we went down. So on the permeability test holes, we only allow them to use clean water flush. Um, and that ensured that any permeability testing we did was accurate. Uh, and occasionally we had to use, uh, we decided that we'd use hybrid holes. So in these ones, they could use the water flush. And um, we accepted that there's going to be reduced recovery. Um, but we generally use those for the short holes on the canal. The hand pits we use for the superficials. So we used it to identify what the superficial material was, and collect samples for testing. We also used it to identify the depth of the silk creek and if we could, the thickness. So they were mostly used on the island along the canal and in the forebay. So here's a bit of a map of where we put all the boreholes. So you see it's relatively busy. Um, but so the, the pink ones that we're looking at, these are the recovery holes. So next to next to each of these, oh, sorry, hidden behind these, you'll also see there's water testing holes in pairs. Um, the green ones are the trial pits, um, and the, the hand pits are up in the north here. Uh, and the hybrid hole that you can see in the centre on the canal. So now a bit of in, uh, information about the site work. So there was two of us there, uh, my colleague Paul uh, and myself. Uh, so Paul's a, the principal engineering geologist, and I was uh, the assistant engineering geologist. So we, what was really important and what worked really well was to divvy up what our roles were before uh, before we went on to site and make sure that we were we were really clear on this. So I've looked at various aspects of the of the GI program and looked at who did what. So in terms of site supervision, uh, both Paul and I would would do that. So we were because of the the work was occurring uh, 12 hours a day uh, from sort of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, what we we did was split the shifts. So um, alternate weeks, one of us would do a morning shift about seven till two, and then the other person would do an afternoon shift about um, midday till uh, midday till 7 p.m. So that would allow us two hours in the middle where we crossed over, where we could tell each other what was going on on the, on the site uh, and then it allowed us to use our morning or our evening to to work in the office and to produce the reports uh, do all the the necessary paperwork that we needed to do so paul um he took on uh, stuff like inspecting equipment uh, and checking compliance with the specification um in addition to what i did in terms of contract administration um i was use my skills previously as uh, uh, an accountant to check the quantities and update the VOQ, whereas Paul looked more, more strongly in overseeing compliance with the contract and he had the day on decisions. Uh, I also minuted any uh, client or contractor meetings. In terms of geology, um, Paul was primarily uh, 
uh, looking at uh, the contractor's geotech work and he was uh, checking any findings that I'd, I'd done myself. But the majority of the legwork in terms of outcrop mapping, geological mapping, and looking at working with a contractor on logging the core was done by myself. Logistics, Paul was doing much wider stuff. So he was organize, ordering and organizing supply of materials, solving issues with equipment, uh, liaising with the contractor with the, to do with the rigs and organizing third party site visits. So my role in terms of logistics was generally just solving minor issues on site and checking checking the samples that uh, that they were labelled, recorded and stored correctly. Health and safety, so we were both first aiders. Um, Paul was looking at the wider picture, so he checked the contractor's health and safety pack. Um, and one of the things I was to produce monthly health and safety reports that we passed back to Mark McDonald and the client. And in terms of report production, we both produced daily and weekly diaries on the stuff that we've been doing. Um, but Paul's role largely was completed when the GI ended, whereas I um, was involved in the follow-up reports, including the GIR and the technical note. So here are the, the two rigs that we used So um, for the rotary core boreholes. So the large rig, uh, the CS100, had a 100 millimeter core, and we used this for the land-based and the deeper holes. And then we had a smaller rig, which was much more portable, uh, the UDR400D, that had a 75 mil core, and we used that on the islands and for shallower boreholes. So as we said, here's the, here's the list of the boreholes that we did. Uh, the ones that are in yellow are the recovery holes, uh, and the ones that are in, in blue are the water testing holes, and the ones that are in this pink are the ones that are, are mixed. Trial pits, so we had a series of trial pits across, uh, across the islands. So these were are used to try and get down to the Silk Creek layer. These were all dug by hand because we couldn't get an, a mechanical excavator on site. Um, so what are, we'll talk a bit more about some of the logistic issues with, with making these trial pits, but uh, these were possibly more fun bits to do because we, we got to go out on the boat, uh, out into the into these remote islands uh, and start uh, and find locations that were, were suitable. So we had four there. Um, three of them we terminated on, on the Silk Creek itself, and one of them um, that got to about three and a half metres depth that we had to, to, even though it was still in the alluvium, we had to terminate it because the, we kept getting water ingress at the base. Uh, so the in situ testing, so we, we had um, automated drop SBT hammers um, that we used throughout. So. Uh, just some examples of the results here. So with the alluvium, we're talking, um, so this is alluvial sand. Uh, we were getting up, generally up to about 20. Some of these were, were obstructions. Um, the residual sandstone, we were getting uh, a little bit higher. Sorry, the heavily weathered stuff again, even higher. And then uh, getting down into slightly weathered sandstone. Uh, these were pretty much all refusals or um, extrapolated results. We had some in situ testing, so uh, in terms of the variable and constant head permeability. Test. So you can see on the side here, this was setting up for uh, for a, a falling head test. So we we use the rising and falling head tests for the lower pool of permeability soils and rocks. And here we are measuring the depth of the water. And then we use constant head wherever we encountered higher permeability soil, so where we were going through um, the fine sands. We also did packer testing. Um, so the, these were this was one of the key key things that was was in the specifications. We wanted to get really good results. So getting them seated was a key issue. So one of the problems that you had is if you if you seated partly on uh, hard silkcrete and then softer sand underneath or softer sandstone underneath the water tended to bulge beneath and try and find a, a, an escape route um, so it was really important that we found we use these recovery holes prior to ensure that we seated everything correctly um, and then when we were looking to get the permeability of the silk layers because they had quite wide spaced joints 
uh, occasionally we needed to to drill a, an inclined hole and, and then use an inclined packer so that we intercepted as many of those joints as we could. And then we did a bit of point load testing on site. Um, so we selected the UCS samples first and then the remaining material we tested um, axially, geometrically and, and some lump samples as well. Um, we also designed a monitoring pro program. So this involved different bits. So we had uh, nine vibr vibrating wire piezometers. So we had three at the powerhouse and six at the barrage. And these targeted different strata and different elevations. So this for me was a real uh, learning learning curve. So uh, one thing that I would definitely say is the contractor said, yes, we know about vibrating wire piezometers. Yes, we can install them, no problem at all. Uh, when we get to site, they're not very much, they didn't really know how to install the, the, them. And Paul and I had to learn very, very quickly how, uh, how to install them and get them right. So this involved, um, so what you can see here is, we, is Paul and I in the evening beforehand, um, getting all the zero readings, sticking them into water bottles to transfer to site. Um, and we could, uh, when we got to site, we would create a little, um, we create like a little metal box that we, we fabricated to put the, the data logger in. Um, and then we, I had to make sure that I'd put the battery in and that I'd connected it correctly. And given that how expensive each one of these uh, piece of it as well, I can remember checking three or four times every single one just to make sure that it was wired in and that it was giving, giving readings because I, I thought if I if I make an error here and um and I wire them up incorrectly or I don't uh, install them correctly it's it's going to come back to bite me so uh, once once we got that first set of, uh, of results after three months I, I was really really happy uh, and I could rest a little bit easier um we also had some some normal standpipes uh some of them had uh, had data loggers um, and so, but, and then we had a series of water gauges. So there was already a few of these located in the river, uh, but we installed a couple more, one above the falls and one below. Um, and then we also had standpipes where we just had manual monitoring. So one of the one of the local um, guys, one of the one of uh, Western Powers guys would check this uh, uh, sort of on a daily or or every other day. Um, with a, a manual dip and we also had a barometer so uh, this was used to uh, monitor local pressure variations and allow us to adjust any readings on the VWPs so you, I had to find a site where it wouldn't just get picked up <laughs> uh, so this happens to be in the in the pantry at the, uh, at the campsite so here we are so here are the locations of it so the VWPs on the island the water gauge above the falls and some standpipes with data loggers along the canal and in the southern part um, we have the barometer in the WPC camp down down here with a, a water gauge below the falls here and then we had a range of standpipes standpipes with data loggers and VWP in the uh, powerhouse area so some of the challenges that we encountered during the GI so one of the major ones is the changing river levels. So in Zambia, uh, in the Western province, the rainy season runs from about November to April, with the dry season running May to October. And there's significant water, varia water level variation between these two seasons. Um, so it's more significant below the falls, uh, where it can change by up to 10 metres over the course of the year. So you can see these ones here. Um, of the falls, the the variation is a little bit less extreme, but it's still two metre uh, fluctuations throughout the year. So to give you a bit of an idea of this, I'm going to go through. So every day uh, at, at the lodge that we were staying in, I took a photograph from the same spot out of the window. So this is uh, on the very first day that we arrived. So here we go into day four. So you can see the water level starting to drop. Day eight. Day 12. By day 16, you're starting to see rapids appear here where the um, where the rocks beneath is starting to get exposed. Day 20, 
24. And by day 28, that this part of the river had, um, had been completely blocked off. So th this is a like an oxbow in the in the in the river here. So here's the main river channel, and here's a secondary channel. So by day 28, this had become a pond essentially. Day 32, day 36, 40. Day 52, day 56, day 60. By day 60, this is probably about a four or five meter um, high pile of rocks that um, separates off the two parts of the channel. Get, give you the image there. End of May, end of July. It also impacted where, when and where we could do the boreholes. So here was one of the locations that we wanted to do a borehole in. So this was a, a start of the start uh, in May. So we obviously couldn't do the borehole there at the beginning, but by the end, um, day 52, this was the, the location. So you see it dropped significantly. Here's, here's down at the powerhouse. So you're at the powerhouse location looking out into the river. So when we first arrived, just big large section of river. By the time we finished, a, a sandbank had emerged out from the water as the water level had dropped. Um, one of the issues with that changing water level as well is uh, how it impacted on the trial pits. So because uh, the water level was quite close to where the, where the trial pits were, depending on how far away you were from the river, depending on how long you had before the trial pit started to fill with water. So we developed a, a technique which where we, we would uh, dig down to just above where we thought the water table was on one day. And then on the second day, we'd start nice and early and then we dig down as quickly as we could um, before the water level start, uh, to start to seep in. And that allowed us to, to map and to, to get the samples that we needed before um, the trial pits filled in. Another key, uh, issue that we had was access to the islands. So some of the considerations, we were considering the safety of water. So here you can see Ernest, our, our boatman. Um, so to access all of these islands, we had to cross across the Zambezi. So this quite fast flowing water. Um, so we, we came up with a system where we ensured that the, the boat was always on the islands with the, with the workers. Um, and not based uh, on the mainland, so that ensured that if anything happened on the if anything happened on the island, we could evacuate people as, as quickly as we we could. Um, we also provided Ernest with with a phone so that he we could get in contact with him and let him know when somebody needed to be brought out to the islands. Um, there's also an issue with access to the islands. So you can see here, um, it's quite. The islands themselves have got very, very dense foliage um, that you've got to push your way through. So you've got to find very specific spots to um, to disembark. So here's uh, the smaller rig being taken off the boats and onto the islands. So we managed to find certain areas where there was a bit of sand and uh, that we could do this safely. Uh, this is another spot that we, we landed. So at, at this site, um, when we started, it, it looked a little bit like this, but by the end of the season, as the water had dropped, this has essentially become almost a sheer, sheer drop. So you, you couldn't access this anymore towards the end. And um, it's very dense vegetation. So you had to sort of, to get to some of the pits, you had to push your way through. So uh, you can see here, this is Charles at the front, and he would he would go through um, claiming a spot for us and, and checking uh, checking what was there. So the key the key thing. <laughs> And the key thing that Charles was really good at was checking for wildlife. So key on here is crocodiles <laughs> and snakes. So here's an image of one of the sites we're about to land on. Can anybody spot uh, spot what's there? <laughs> so here you can see it's a Nile crocodile. So um, for a bit of context, that is uh, roughly six to seven meters long. Um, chest about a meter wide um and so when we were about to uh, to land on here the 
crocodile slipped into the water underneath the boat <laughs> and headed off down river and i don't think i've been as terrified in my life <laughs> uh, but lo- luckily i was told that uh, unless you put your hands into the water you should be fine um hippos they're a little bit less of an issue whilst they have a, a very strong reputation for uh, for being particularly dangerous um they don't like the noise of um active works so as long as you're noisy and give them a bit of warning they tend to disappear off into the water and find a, a quieter patch uh, and also snakes so i'll show you some of the some of the snakes that you'll find in zambia later but um the some of them could be tree dwelling so um as you're pushing your way through the trees you need to be really careful what drops on onto you uh here's a here's a footprint of a hippo that, that we found on the island so we know they were visiting it in during the night um we also made sure that we had an evacuation plan and how we were going to get people off if if the worst came to the worst um so charles who i, I showed earlier one of his key key jobs that he did for us was whilst we were working on at the at the locations he would um watch the water so we had to make sure that we were at least five five to six meters away from um from the river edge at all times so that's about the lunging uh, distance of a of a crocodile um, and he would be he would be keeping an eye so if we if we had to work with our backs to the water he would be ensuring that uh, he'd give us early warning so uh, yeah, he he said uh, he said to us on a couple of occasions, "I'm either bait." <laughs> and uh, no, he's, he's, he was very he was very very good. He uh, um, he, he he could read he could read um, read the situation very well, and I did feel very safe um, when he was working with us. So the access to the islands that we talked about earlier. Um, so here the zoom in. In the island, so you can see the falls here, and these red dots represent the borehole locations that we're interested in, and these green dots are the trial pits. So, when we were getting access, the initial place that we would start was down here. So, the main site and most of the things that we were interested in are on this east bank here. So, this was our first launch point. So, when we started. The water level here was high enough that you could uh, get the boat cross and cross between the islands um, and that was quite easy and then if you needed to go and scout these uh, hand locations you could go up here uh, along the along the river and, and pop to each location one by one but some of you may spot something going on between these two lines here so you see these horizontal features so we're going to zoom in on there. So what you can see here are individual layers of this silkrete jury crust that run across um, east to west. And as the water level dropped, these became exposed um, and the rocks would appear out of the water. So it'd be quite dangerous then uh, to get to, particularly when you wanted to load a a boat full of um, equipment, including the, the drill rig, it was very difficult to get it across here safely. So that was probably from about late June. So then we had to look for alternatives. So one of the places we could go from was here. This was the second launch port point. So this was OK for for taking across just people um, because it was located in, in a lot of reeds and lo- lodging the boat was uh, was not that easy but you couldn't really get a drill rig across from here so we had to look at a third launch point so this is where the old pontoon was located uh, was located that used to get the uh, get people across the river before the bridge was built so towards the end of the uh, the program we launched from this area here and we could access the points in this much deeper water one of the issues that you had to really consider however is that in order to get from this side, you had to go all the way south, cross over the bridge, all the way north, and that could be a 30 to 40 minute journey to do that each time. So we had to ensure we planned each day. Um, and if we split the labor between the two sites to avoid having to go backwards and forwards. So here's a here's a video that so you might want to have a look at afterwards. Um, the full the full video is available on YouTube. 
it's a video called Africa is not for sissies Paul story so I apologize for the for the language as, as a game I myself I appreciate that it's not very it's not a particular PC word um, but the video is worth is definitely worth watching um, it's it's uh, gives you a bit of a, a taster of, of how how the zombie river can be so on this particular event um, the when the pontoon was crossing the river so this is a, a it's essentially a, a, a barge like boat and it would uh it would cross over the river a couple of times a day um and on this particular occasion it uh stuck on the rocks and people were were stuck trapped on on the river so i'm going to play this a bit of this video for you to, to see a little bit about it so the context is uh the boat the boat has got stuck onto the rocks and um, there are people waiting to be rescued on the island. Three days. Roughly about 1300, one o'clock, the F arrived and I told him that the guys in the boat need to be got off um, you see the as a priority because they were in the, the most danger, the they were also in the most discomfort and also over and above the fact that I felt um, I was responsible for an abandoning Paul. Hey, I would tell you, sir. Paul, They flew a number of, of recon flights over the boats and over the pontoons and came back, they refueled and roughly at about 1600, 4 o'clock, they said, right, they were now going to take the guys off the boat. I was situated at the, at the main control area where the, the, the operations area, um, I could see the flights. I could not see the people on the pontoon from where so that's I was. really nice footage of the, the force were were both. <laughs> up in the trees were able to see what went on in the boat itself. And they give them the rope and they tie them. Now we were very far. We can see what's going on there, but it was not clear. And then suddenly the chopper drives. It flies, but it didn't fly straight, like it goes up. It went on the side, and then that's when it tipped every boat. It was from the boat. Then the boat turns over. And then from there, the rope runs in the water. I think it was for three to four, three to four, four hundred meters. That's when the rope goes up. So when the rope goes up, we couldn't see it was actually we, when we see the boat goes down and we knew that all those guys were there, they didn't put them in the rope because they were planned. So now we're thinking who's on the rope and who was on the boat, who is gone. Oh, Paul, I'm going to zoom forward a little bit here. So here we go, here's the, here's the rescue. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to let you go away and look at that at the end of that video to yourself. Um, it, it just gives you a bit of an indication of how dangerous the, the river can be. 
some other logistic issues that we came across, um, getting good Ford signal across the site. So one of the mornings I arrived and I was looking around, I was uh, looking for Eric, uh, my driver, and, and I couldn't find him. And he said, I'm up here. So this was him getting Ford signal up in one of the trees. <laughs> it was the only place that we could uh, we could get uh, we could get reliable phone service. Uh, the second is is getting supplies, particularly fuel for the for the vehicles. So what you'll find in Western provinces is, is this is a petrol station essentially. So running from the north of Zambia to the south, the the fuel tankers come uh, come down that that road heading towards Namibia. Uh, and they will, uh, as they go along, um, quite often they, they sell bits of that material to local people who will then uh, sell it on, uh, sell it on to people nearby. But quite often the supplies were very, very patchy. So sometimes you had to go all the way down, uh, sometimes you had to head all the way down through the Western province and into Namibia in order to get a reliable uh, supply of fuel because by time it got to the petrol stations in Zambia. They'd already sold most of it off to to local suppliers. Um, we also had to because we didn't have. It was very it wasn't uh, supplies in um, at short notice. We had to do a lot of on site fabrication. Um, so one of the guys here was um, we gave him some specifications for building these boxes to put the cataloguers on, and it was fantastic. He could just anything that you suggested he could make um, and you didn't need to go away and buy him. Uh, he, he could come up with something uh, pretty, pretty easy. Big logistic issue, sand. So um, one of the issues we were forever having was the um, vehicles getting stuck in the sand. So the so one of the uh, the contractor was particularly stubborn about this. So, um, Every it kept getting stuck, but he just didn't change. <laughs> just didn't change the plan. Just kept kept going at it. Um, and we were saying, that, could you not get a, a four by four or a tractor or something that could go on the sand? But no, he was uh, was determined to to use his, his same truck. Um, so we so we needed to make sure that we uh, we factored that in and tried to find the the best access across that sand. So I was talking before here's some of the wildlife that you're to be fearful of in the area. So boom slang, these poisonous snakes that you find in the in the trees. So my colleague Laura uh, found one of these on site when she was there. I, I didn't see one myself. Black mambas, um, probably quite famous as being one of the most poisonous snakes in the world. Didn't see any black mambas luckily, but probably the most dangerous snake um, in Zambia is the puff adder. So this one, um, it, when it bites you, it, it locks on. So it will give you mul it can give multiple injections of venom in, in one go. And they tend to like warm, dry, cool areas. So that can be sides of the road um, where where there's a bit of long grass. Or one of the particular things you have to be worried about is they quite like core boxes because um, they're quite warm and dry as well. So whenever we open the core box, we normally do it with a stick. <laughs> um, to just keep keep an eye and see if it's there. Um, scorpions. Um, one of the one of the drill crew was bitten by a scorpion that was in his glove. Um, and then he had to go to the hospital because he had some swelling from that. Um, mosquitoes, big issue. Uh, it is a malarial region, so we need to make sure that we were taking uh, malarial tablets. And then, as I said before, uh, crocodiles particularly dangerous. Uh, hippos. So there were some resident hippos that were quite near to the site. Um, and if you want to see some wonderful camera work, here's my attempt at, at videoing the hippos as we went past. So there we are. No Pulitzer Prize for me, but hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, where the uh, where the hippos are. Um, health and safety again was a, a huge concern. So um, here you can see when we first when we first did the trial pit, we sort of left the contractor to it um, to start off with, and then we went when we went across. This is what we found. Um, so here you've got a pit that's probably about two meters deep, 
it's got all the spoil piled on the side and it had a, a diesel generator quite close to the lip of the, <laughs> of the trial pit so as you can imagine probably all the most dangerous things you could do with the trial pit so we made sure that when they were dug that um, in future that they always used a step one that was always a, an egress point um, and that they were always wearing appropriate PPE uh, to, to dig those pits. It was better that we dug a bigger pit than um, and took longer and to make sure it was safe than to, to rush and, and put anyone in danger. Core recovery. So core recovery was a, a particular issue. There are a couple of problem ball holes. This one here was an absolute nightmare. Um, most of the, the ball holes took between so two to three days to, to complete. Um, this one took about three and a half weeks, four weeks. <laughs> so it was a, it, it, it really um, ate in the time. And the real issue here was that down at the powerhouse, there were very, very thick alluvial uh, deposits. So these are sands and, and bits of gravel. So every time you tried to put a core barrel in, and quite often the core barrel would get stuck. Um, you wouldn't be able to advance it much further. So quite often you'd have to drill uh, you'd have to grout it up again and then drill through the grout just in order to give yourself a, a stabilised hole. Yeah. One of the interesting ones, I'm going to set you a bit of a challenge so you can work out what the answer is to the price for anyone who can, who can get it. So here at this site, we found that we kept losing flush and the, and the pressure was low. The flush was pooling at the surface uh, in little puddles all around the rig. Um, can anyone think of what might be the the issue here? I'll give you a clue there. Is that a termite mound? It's a termite mound, yeah. yeah. Well done, Kieran. <laughs> so here we are. So what was happening is all of the flush was going in, was finding these these termite mounds and these underground burrows and was running through them and popping out at the surface. So the solution we had was we either moved the borehole a few meters away and hope for the best, uh, which is, was probably the first solution, or we wait a while for the grout to fill the holes and commence again. So which one do you think the contractor went for? <laughs> the first one, yeah, and, uh, but it did work, so it wasn't too bad. Uh, so some of the findings of the GI. So let's look uh, local geology. So here are the alluvial deposits that we found. So these uh, were loose, medium dense, cream to yellow fine, uh, fine grained silty sand. So these we found all the way on the um, along the banks of the river and surrounding the islands. Uh, they were generally about one to two meters thick, but they could be up to up to about five meters thick on the island. Uh, as I said before, the powerhouse had a transient sandbar, which had a really thick deposit of about 15 metres of it. And occasionally you get these dark grey sandy silt clay layers where some vegetation has been established. And at the base, you often have a, a cobble or gravel lag just above the silt or sandstone below. Aeolian deposits, I didn't have a very good picture of the aeolian deposits because there wasn't that many in the main part of the site, but um my uh, my driver eric he his uh his home happened to have really good examples of a of aeolian deposits because it was up on the hill um so here's a photograph that you can see so it consists of sand dunes from the edge of kalahari desert and it not tends to be not that thick so um generally about um two or three meters but it can rarely be about six meters and you generally find it on the higher ground away from the current relic river channels. So consequently, it's rarely encountered within the footprints of the structures. The jury crust, so we talked about those earlier. Uh, so these are the pedogenic pan deposits um, and formed by induration of the deposits as the water levels fluctuate. And it generally reduces your intact permeability. Um, so it fills, it fills in the spaces between the grains uh, and it all, as a byproduct of that, it also increases the strength. So there are three types that we found, silcrete, calcrete, and ferricrete. Uh, so the silcrete you can see here, so it's strong to very strong pink and white, fine to medium grain sa silicified sandstone. Um, so it's found in two different 
forms. It forms a distinct silvery cap that's about one to two meters that's um, far across the site. And you could also find thinner um, layers of it deeper down, which probably represent uh, previous stages. Uh, and they are of different sizes and, and thicknesses. But all the way around the riverbanks, you can see these big boulders of silcrete. Um, and there's a bit of silcrete gravel and in, in, in some of the alluvial deposits, uh, this gravel lag that I talked about. The calcrete, um, you don't find this as often. Uh, and where you do it tends to be on higher ground. Um, it's extremely weak to very weak, uh, light grey and medium grained. And it tends to be eroded when it's exposed, and, and that's part of the reason why you don't find it so often. So here's here's the the sump that was dug for the one of the uh, one of the boreholes at the powerhouse. You see quite a deposit of this calcrete, and then the ferry creek, um, We found it in two forms: uh, a strongly developed form, which was sort of reddish brown, blotched, um, and it was a hard pan. Uh, and then we also found a sort of weakly formed version that was sort of yellow browned um, and nodular and you've sort of found it surrounded by sand. You generally found this in the north of the, the scheme on the islands, but it was a minor component in some other parts. So one of the nice ways I, I found to represent it is to, to do it on a ternary diagram. So you've got on each on each uh, corner, you've got the um, pure silcrete, pure ferricrete and pure calcrete. So the types that we had, pure ferry creek was found on the large island and a little bit in near the intake. Pure still creek, you found all the way under the barrel. Um, Cow creek, you can find on the high ground above the powerhouse. And then most of the stuff that you found fell into one of the categories. You found a silk creek with a bit of uh, ferry creek content, or you found um, Silk creek with some calcrete content. So if you put a, a hydrochloric acid on it, it fizzed, and, and that showed you that it had some element of the calcrete in it. Sandstone um, underneath. So we split this into into different types. So you have the residual sandstone. Uh, we separated this out from alluvial deposits because it generally was uh, was denser in form and it didn't have uh, it didn't have any structures. Um, but we knew that. Um, but by looking at it and looking at the size of the grains, we knew that it was uh, originated from the weathered sandstone and the sandstone itself. And then what we were calling silicified sandstone. So this was quite silky, um, but it had some degree of uh, cementation. Uh, so we found this across the whole scheme. Um, it could be up to 40 meters thick and it's affected by weathering for the full depth. So we split it into what we call partially weathered material, which was uh, essentially rock, heavily weathered material, where it had weathered enough that it was uh, it was a soil, and then residual material where it had weathered completely. Bit of in some images you can see through it, residual and the completely, uh, and the highly, and moderately, slightly, and fresh down here. And finally, the dolerite and basalt. So the only time we got access to this on site was when it came out of the, the borehole. Uh, so it's medium strong to very strong, um, purple brown, fine to medium grained. So it's found we found it was a fairly consistent elevation and no more than about two meter variation over the whole area. And so it's playing out and laterally consistent. And we found these sinuous veins running through that form the horizontal joint. And the upper sort of uh, 2 to 0.5 meters of it is hydrothermally altered and weak. Uh, um, so if you need to found on this material, you probably want to go beyond that hydrothermally altered zone that you can see indicated here by this chlorite alteration and this discoloration to a brown. So we could also get uh, to look at this material by going to some of the quarries. Um, the the nearest one that we had was down in Sasheki, so a, a few kilometres to the, the south, about 100 kilometres to the south, um, and we were able to have a bit of a closer look at the material. Uh, geomorphology, so we picked up geomorphology from aerial photography, so um, here's, here's the aerial photography and, and here's what we could pick out. So up on the island, heavily vegetated, so we couldn't really see what the, the 
uh, material was underneath there. But we've got a different differential in colour here between this sort of orangey material and this grey yellow in the middle. So the orangey material is the aeolium deposit. Uh, we know the aeolium because of the, the ferric content in them. And then in the middle, we've got the alluvial deposits. So these were deposited by this old river channel that used to run, run, run through here. We've got these sort of yellowy patches here, and they're made ground. So this is where they'd be, the top has been stripped, um, either to provide um, gravel aggregate, um, or in this location here, there's, a, there's actually a, a school a schoolyard. Down at the bottom here, these are the little beach sand deposits along the river. This brown stuff here, uh, possibly a little bit of soft sediment that you can find along that old riverbed. And all these little dots here are the termite mounds that you can see. So we, when the silk was exposed, we mapped it. Um, so we went out and uh, looked at the individual joint sets to, to get an idea of what the silk was. So we could see that there were there was at least two joint sets in it, set one and set two. Um, and in terms of uh, the third set is horizontal, so essentially a bit like bedding, but you can't, it's obviously this top surface and then um, that periodic bits down. Um, so there you are, so it was oriented roughly north, south, east, west. And one of the key things of the geomorphology is looking at the, at the river itself. So to get your eye in here, so you can see this, these overhanging bits that you run along here, this is the hard Sill Creek cap. And underneath it here is a, a very weakly poly cemented sandstone. So the formation of the falls happens in, in stages. So first the weak sandstone erodes at a faster rate than the more resistant Sill Creek cap, and this undermines the falls. The undermined silcrete above um, subsides and fractures, and this creates a pathway for the water of the river to get even uh, better into that underlying sandstone. Then the water ingress through that sandstone leads to further erosion of the, of the weak material below. Eventually, it leads to complete failure of the overlying silcrete. The silcrete topples in blocks into the river channel and the regression continues then so this process happens bit by bit so one of the things that you can notice is the water is not just flowing over the top but it's flowing out from underneath that silk grid this was something that um the contractor was particularly interested in because he wanted to know whether any of the structures might see the process up or whether the uh, sorry the client uh, wanted to know whether this um this process might be sped up by any of the construction that we were doing and how fast this was occurring when we when we looked at historical maps and aerial photographers we found this was actually a, a relatively slow process and we could discern uh, no more than about five to ten meter regress over a sort of 50 year period and given that the um the work were far, quite a way away from the that that wasn't a, a huge a huge problem but uh, further investigation was definitely needed So um, I'll whiz through this, this bit here. So looking at the original objectives, we looked at the depth of the silk and the thickness, the webbing profile and the permeability. So here's a reminder of, uh, of where the boreholes were and the ground profile as we went along. So uh, as you go along the, the barrage, you have a silk cap, uh, you have a zone of heavily weathered sandstone underneath, which is a behaves like a soil, a zone of partially weathered sandstone, and then alluvium as you, you go around the islands at the top. So consistent as you run along, you see that silk creeks um, pretty much the same until you get to the channel. So this is where we reach that big wide channel on the eastern side of the river. And at that point, it starts to step down. The alluvium gets thicker, the silk creek gets thinner, um, and the, the heavily weathered sandstone beneath gets a little bit thicker as well. And here's the, the main river channel. So you see the islands in the centre, the mainland on the on the right here on the east, and one of the larger uh, islands out to the west. Uh, you can see the, the silk creeks a little bit thinner. 
Um, but what, what we could notice was that these little hatch bits were zones where you had more weathered material within otherwise better, um, less weathered stuff, which shows that it was there's not a clear um, pattern of increase of decreasing weathering with depth. So you had to be really wary of these and how they may influence things. Um, so we did all the permeability results here. We could identify that the engineering soils were generally above 10 to the minus six and the engineering rocks were generally below 10 to the minus six with the silcrete generally being negligible. So essentially what, what you're looking at here is the silcrete when you're testing it, it is essentially like an alpha quartzite, almost um, there is, there's no porosity at all. Um, it's behaving more like a metamorphic rock. And so actually you, the, you wouldn't expect there to be a flow. Um, so what you need to, what we were really interested in was whether this was just because the test section we were looking at didn't have a, access to any fractures or whether the this was um, more representative. So we needed to do things like incline boreholes to try and intercept them and see what we could get, uh, see if we could identify whether that permeability, mass permeability was the same as the, the intact permeability. So the impact on the structures. Um, so when we when you were building the embankment across um, the grout curtain to stop the water from coming underneath would would be um, at least eight meters depth. So you'd see that it's into that weathered sandstone that had much lower permeability. The canal, so we were interested in thickness and depth of the silcrete. So here's you know, the ball holes that you can see. So the red ones recovery, the blue ones water testing and the, the green ones the trial pits. So in this one here is pre we didn't we didn't have very much of this heavily weathered material. We went pretty much straight from from the silcrete into um, into sandstone that, that was behaving as an engineering rock. Um, but we could identify in some locations these secondary bands of silcrete underneath. So again, coming a bit further along, we weren't able to. Um, in this area, we weren't sure whether this secondary silcrete band continued. Um, Along, but as we head towards the, the forebay, we suddenly get this sudden drop off where we get this big heavily weathered zone. And this is related to, to that low low lying area. Uh, yeah, as we said, uh, at, the, at the northern part of the, the canal, there there is very little of that low weathered zone. So one of the ways that we looked at that was to look at the GPR and compare it to what we got from the boreholes. So in general, we found that the GPR was was reasonably good at identifying the thickness of the silcrete, but not brilliant at the depth. Uh, so, it, it, so opposite way around. When the silcrete distinct bands, it were you would only get the top the top band registered, and uh, quite often if it occurred. In up fashion, you get a lot of noise and they would uh, tell you that there was more of a, a silcrete layer than there was. Permeability at the canal, um, not a huge amount of testing here, but the um, where we did find it, the, we found that the, um, most of the materials were between about 10 to the minus 6 and 5. So in terms of leakage, it justifies this uh, canal being concrete. Find. Uh, an interesting thing we did find was the temporary artesian conditions, artesian conditions experienced at a hole 207. And we wondered whether this was that it was trapped beneath the silcrete layer um, as the water was dropping over the course of the year. The forebay, so we wanted the ground profile and the permeability of the superficials. Plan of it there. Uh, and we're looking at three section so the first one is across this embankment to the north the second one across this embankment to the south and the third one in the center so uh, on the embankments um on on the high ground we had found calcrete so uh, as we say this is um generally not as resistant as the silcrete uh, and it tends to um eroded away if it has if it's affected by 
by the river or a historic river channel. Um, so in the in the north where the, the ground level was a bit higher, this cow creek was preserved, but in the on the southern embankment it wasn't preserved as well. And in the southern embankment we could find these uh, more um, silk creek bands. And in the center um, we had very, very deep deposits of material that all behaves a bit like sand, alluvial deposits, residual sandstone and heavily weathered. OK, so the GI objectives for the powerhouse. Uh, we wanted to know the depth of the basalt, the weathering profile and the groundwater regime. So we got two long sections, north, uh, north, south and east, west. So here we are looking. So this is powerhouse location where we are on the alluvial sands here. And we're looking into the hillside to the north. So we, we could, uh, in there, we could top. So um, trust me, behind this, uh, behind the trees here, you can see the. You can see there's a layer of silcrete, and these blocks here are silcrete that have been eroded out and have dropped down off the hillside onto the top. And underneath that is the heavily weathered material. So here we are. This is looking uh, east west. So the high ground that we were talking about there is the calcrete and the silcrete and the heavily weathered material on the, the banks. There are the boulders that, that drop down. And then we have this big chunk of deep alluvium and residual material that really thickens out towards the centre of that channel. So in terms of excavation, that's, that's going to be quite easy to, to remove. However, the, there are issues with the permeability on the sides of the uh, of the powerhouse and, and how that will affect the pressure profile. And then if we look at it north south, you can see um, the thickening out of that alluvium um, as we go towards the, the river itself. In terms of permeability, um, we the engineering soils again are generally above 10 to the minus six, the engineering rock generally uh, below 10 to the minus 5. Um, there was very limited silcrete exposure, so we couldn't get uh, permeability tests on it. And where it was present, it was generally broken. And the groundwater level um, that you find there is, a, is very closely associated, associated with the river level. OK, so we can summarise the permeability observations as alluvium, high permeability, silcrete, very low permeability when intact, but the permeability increases and is controlled by the joints, which are wildly spaced. And the sandstone, fresh and slightly weathered, has low permeability. Highly and completely weathered, has slightly higher permeability and behaves like sand. And it's controlled by the degree of weathering and often associated with weathering around the joints. OK, so I think I'm running on quite, quite a while here, so I might skip through some of this. Um, so some of the other findings we found strength. Um, the silcrete itself was had very high UCS values up to uh, 220 plus. Um, the sandstone itself was much, much uh, weaker, generally um, about two to five, um, but can get up to sort of 10 or 32. And the basalt um, was also quite strong. Excavatability. So one of the things we looked at was um, how easy would this material be to excavate when we were uh, creating the structures. So on the left here, you can see the silk creek. So this is a, a, a GSI plot um, with the um, different types of excavation uh, methodology behind them. So for the silk creek capping layer, so that's a that thick layer at the top, it generally falls in the blasting zone. Whereas the, the lower silcrete layers um, fall in sort of hammer and blasting down into ripping. But what one of the, so e even though we were found that they were, uh, they may require blasting, when you actually look at the structures, you can see that it occurs as a, um, as a band and underneath is the sandstone. So actually it may be easier to just excavate below the silcrete, um, undermine it, um, and uh, basically peck her into the into the silcrete, break it off in chunks, uh, and just essentially allow gravity to break it itself. Um, so 
even though it's it's particularly hard um, and durable, it, it can be it can be broken a bit easier. The sandstone itself, uh, no problem at all. You can easily rip that, um, and in some cases, you can dig it out, particularly in the heavily weathered stuff. Groutability. So we were interested in how could you grout this material. Um, so uh, the groutability of the rock and soil layers. It, around key engineering structures is a key consideration of the design. As discussed when talking about the active processes at Nagonia and the erodibility of the sandstone, the creation of preferential pathways for seepage between the embankments and the weir has potential to affect the integrity of the foundations and consequently the integrity of the structure above. With material varying from loose and medium dense alluvial sands to fractured and intact silcrete, uh, there are a range of grouting solutions which could be considered. The two key locations for grounding equipment are beneath the barrier and at the powerhouse. The options we could employ was a use of a cut-off trench through the loose and medium dense sand, permeation grouting and jet grouting. So you can see here um, we looked at the PSDs and we looked at the particular um, types of grout that we might need to use and found that for the alluvial material and again for the weathered sandstone, um, a, a water glass solution was probably the best best for that. So alluvial and residual sands will be best treated for the use of that cutoff trench or jet grouting. Permeation grouting would be possible, but only with the use of a water glass solution. Secrete fat fractures could be grouted using an ordinary penetration intrusion, intrusion type method using ordinary Portland cement. However, the design of the grout holes would need to be arranged to best ensure that the fractures are intersected. As such, the use of inclined holes would have the best chance of intersecting these vertical fracture sets. It's unlikely to be possible to extend a cutoff trench through the silcrete cap into the underlying heavily weathered sandstone. So consequently, other grouting methods might be considered. Jet grouting or permeation grouting using a water glass solution might be appropriate. Material reuse. So the formation of the weir, uh, barge embankments. So we, the, Sorry, uh, the material reuse requirements. Um, you need it for the formation of the weir bank, weir barrage embankments, the canal embankments for the four bay embankments, and for the um, CFRD ones adjacent to the powerhouse. You also want to consider concrete production and the formation of cement stabilized sand, uh, rip wrap, and the fill below the structures. So the sources you could potentially have are the silcrete itself, very right about into blocks, the weak sandstone beneath. Um, the alluvial sands, the rheolian sands, and the residual. So the previous con contractor, the North Plan, had done a. Um, so the pre, yeah, the previous contractor, North Plan, had done a map of uh, of area where they could potentially use uh, identify this material. So one of them here, I'm going to show you now, um, is a is a silcrete quarry to the north. Uh, so this is being used as road aggregate, uh, so by a Chinese company. Um, and so it, the, potentially you could use this silkrete material. If you wanted to use basalt, um, you have a bit of a problem because you, the nearest mine location is Sheki, 140 kilometers away and an hour, almost two hour drive between the two. Um, one of the possible solutions is actually the um, copper trucks come down from the north here and then they head out down to Sosheki and they go out through um, the Caprivi strip in the um, in um, Namibia. So when those trucks return they're empty so you potentially bring back the material on those empty uh, copper trucks. So the material for the aggregate the street is very high strength high durability uh, has no deleterious content but however, it does have a risk of alkali silica reactivity. You can easily identify it in the cap, but it's harder to separate from the rest of the sandstone. So the silcrete could be used for things like rip wrap um, and for aggregate. Variable cemented weak sandstone. It's very low strength, very low durability. That's high water absorption, but it is abundant. So generally you would only be able to use this maybe for a, a bit of rock fill, or you could use it for something Low, lower quality like blinding concrete and the basalt, the dolerite, not available on site. Generally, no deleterious content except in that hydro hydrothermally altered top bit. 
uh, but it's high strength, high durability, and has a low water absorption. Um, the sand and gravels, again, we found that these are generally too fine um, to be to be ideal for use in concrete. So I'm coming to the end. Um, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about the off time. So it wasn't all hard work. So this is my favourite activity on site, which was um, which was fishing. So in, in the rivers here, there are these things called tiger fish, and they're so much. If you're if anyone's a keen angler, uh, these are really great to to fish for. So you you troll the um, you rod off the the back of the boat, and you could. And these things swim really, really fast. The predatory fish, um, and, and when you feel when you feel the tugging, uh, it's a real it's a real battle that you have to ca catch them. Uh, Paul, my uh, my colleague on the site, was he's really he's a really really keen angler. I, I've uh, until I went to Zambia, I wasn't uh, hadn't really done it before, uh, but he was really jealous because he he couldn't catch one every time he went out, and the first time I went out, I caught two. Uh, so yeah, I was really pleased with that, and lots of uh, we've got uh, lots of nice wildlife. So um, there you are. There's a, a falcon there, uh, a crocodile that I took a picture of, uh, some water buck. This is my uh, uh, this is my lodge that I stayed in. So I had a really nice view out out from there, and that was view out of my window one morning with all these uh, vervet monkeys, uh, some baboons, and then just every, every morning and every evening when I went to site and returned from site, it was just beautiful scenery. So it, it was a real pleasure to, to work there. Uh, and finally, made lots of really good friends. Um, Eric, in particular, here, he was he was really good at he taught me um, the local language, Lozi, so I could communicate a little better. Um, and I helped him with I helped him with his his maths and his science that he was studying for. Um, but yes, it was real a privilege to work with with these people. So some conclusions, key takeaways: good preparation is always key. So we were very lucky in that um, the previous people who'd been had done a, a lot of a lot of work um, and, and they'd experienced all of the negative things and were able to put this into the new plan. So everything ran much more to clockwork. Local knowledge is invaluable. Um, speaking to speaking to the guys that live there, they can tell you where there are particular outcrops um, and they can also help you with logistical issues. Clearly defined roles are important um, because Paul and I knew exactly what we needed to do and when, when and how we reported to one another. Um, we were able to to do everything efficiently. Geological information is everywhere, and some of it is free. Uh, so if you, if you walk, if there are quiet moments when you when you're drilling, you should wander away from the uh, from the site and have a look about, and you can quite often find out useful information can bring into your uh, investigation. Health and safety and risk assessment is paramount. There are a lot of things to be scared of in Zambia, but in, big through a lot of um, preparation work and being really careful, we pretty much minimise these risks and, and we're able to work in a safe manner. And being with the local community really enriches the experiences. And finally, Zambia is beautiful. Um, if you can visit it, I really recommend that you do. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? It's very strange um, talking without being able to hear anybody or see anybody, um, but I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I'd welcome any questions. Fab, thanks Matt. Um, we're running on quite a bit, so um, I guess let's just do one question. And then if anybody else has any other questions, then they can drop you an email. Perfect. Yeah, no problem. So does anyone have a question? Oh, you might have gotten away with it. Oh, no, everybody's, everybody's tired. They're like this. <laughs> They're like me on here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, uh, anybody. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any any questions if you want to contact me via by email. And thank you for bearing with me.
No, it was great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for um, for doing that. Um, I guess we'll leave it there then. Um, so our next presentation is happening on the 16th of February, um, and that will be a Zoom call, um, and you'll receive the invite for that um, uh, this week, some point. Um, so virtual round of applause for Matt. Um, thank you for presenting today. And I guess have a lovely week, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Well done, Matt. You can breathe now. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So it's 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 really odd. It's really odd because um, normally you have a room of people and you can bounce bounce off them, but you, you're sort of talking into into space.